I invite your attention to some words of Paul uh, to the Corinthians in his second letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 3 and 4. Let me read these words to you. This is what he said. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and so on. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and particularly verses 3 and 4. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, and so on. I want to speak of the warfare and the weapons of the warfare in this discourse. This is what Paul is speaking about here to these Corinthians. And although he wrote these words 2,000 years ago, I don't think there's any more words that could be of higher relevance, greater significance, uh, to be said, to be thundered forth uh, to the evangelical world today. I believe if Paul were alive today, he would be saying the very same thing as he wrote to the Corinthians. He would be saying the very same thing to us. 2,000 years ago, now, I believe he would be addressing us in words like this. We live in the world, okay, but we don't wage war as the world does. We live in the world, and we're in a war. But the weapons of our warfare are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they're quite different. They're of a different order and of a different power and of a different nature altogether. Now, that's the subject of this discourse. And I say again, I believe it to be highly significant, full of relevance, and a very necessary word for today. And I hope... Uh, I'm not saying about my discourse, but I hope that the apostles' words will reach a great many evangelicals. And not only that they will hear these words, but that they will act upon them. Now, let me start. Paul is clearly making some fundamental assumptions here. We, we call them uh, presuppositions. He's got certain things in his mind which he's taken for granted. Let me explain what I mean. Well, he's talking about we. We. We do this. We do that. We don't do this. We do the other. And so on. Now, who's the we? Well, we're not having to guess. We don't have to try and work it out. We just go back to the opening verse of the letter, chapter 1, verse 1, and it's quite clear he's writing to the believers at Corinth. And you can go on reading through the letter and nothing is made him change his mind. All the way through, he is addressing the believers at Corinth. Now, when I say believers, I don't mean they, mean they have some vague belief in a God or something like that. These are men and women who, by the Spirit of God, have been born again, repented of their sins, having been convicted of their sins, and being converted to Jesus Christ. They're relying upon him, his blood and righteousness. They know him, they trust him, they rely upon him, they lean upon him, they hang upon him. They are truly saved, washed in his blood, and clothed in his righteousness. And he's writing, Paul is writing, to these believers who are in uh, union with each other in the ecclesia, in Corinth. You can read the letter and read the first letter and you'll find the same all the way through. This is the people he is addressing. Is he addressing you, my friend? This is the first great presupposition. What I'm saying here, because this first 
uh, these verses are to do with it, what I'm saying here applies to the genuine believer. Are you a true believer? If you are not, these words do not apply to you. I want you to go on listening, by all means. And I hope God will speak through them to you. But your great need is not to engage in this warfare or understand about this warfare. Your great need is to trust Christ and become a believer. Then you will enter into this and then these words will apply to you. But your first and great concern is to call upon Christ and be saved. You must be converted to him. But that's the first great presupposition. He is addressing believers and so am I. But now the second great presupposition. He takes it for granted that all these believers are living in a war zone. We, he says, are waging war. Now, when he says we, he's talking to believers. I've said that. Now, let me stress that. He's not talking to pastors, inverted commas, whoever they may be. He's not talking to the elders. He's not talking to ministers unless you use the word minister in the proper new covenant sense, which means every believer. He's addressing every believer, the newest believer and the oldest believer, men and women, all of us, all of us believers. He takes it for absolutely for granted. He says, we live in the world. Well, that's true, yeah. And we're engaged in a war. But we don't wage war as the world does, but we, we're in war. Now, we're not, as it were, in the Second World War, United Kingdom, living in London or Bristol or Sheffield or whatever and being bombed. We're actually on the front line. If I can picture it in the First World War, we're actually in the trenches in Flanders. We're actually in Gallipoli. In the Second World War, we're actually on the beaches of Normandy. We were actually engaged, says Paul. We're in the warfare. This is his great assumption. It's not an option. Ah, oh, well, I'm a believer. Now, I, I, I don't want to be in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. <laughs> There's no option about it. As soon as you become a believer, you're enrolled in the Army or the Navy or whatever it is, the military. Ephesians 6. Again, the same point. Again and again throughout the New Testament. The picture of the believer is one who is in a war zone. Now, let me stress that. You're talking spiritually, of course. Believers are spiritual people. And the warfare is spiritual. In fact, Paul is making this point. It's not worldly. We're not talking about worldly war. We're talking about spiritual war. But let's make that point. Let's stress it here. The picture of the believer in the New Testament is not one who's in a holiday camp having a jolly fine time on the beach with an ice cream. He's not in the music hall or, or in the theater. He's not in the hospital. He's not in the, or in the banking house or the business house. The picture of the believer is not pleasurable or business or money or entertainment or whatever it might be, the shopping mall. It's not that. What is the picture for the believer? War. And he's got a weapon in his hand too. The weapons of our warfare. We wage war with weapons. We're actually engaged in the fighting, spiritually speaking. Ephesians chapter 6 again, we've got armor and we've got weapons. We're in battle. Now, I'm not making any political or social point here whatsoever. Please understand me. My father-in-law, just to show you the personal, was a lifelong conscientious objector. And in the First World War, as a young man, he suffered very badly for his stance as a conscientious objector. So I'm not making any political or scoring any social points or whatever you want to say. I'm not doing that. But I want to say this, without being offensive to anybody, there is no conscientious objector in this warfare. None of us can opt out. We're not on the TV stuff with the cameras and the microphone reporting the war. We're not watching a DVD from the armchair seeing how the war was fought. 
were actually on the front line engaged. That is Paul's great presupposition. He's talking, he's talking to believers and believers who are, are in, the, in the war zone, in the war theater, and they've actually got the weapon in their hand. You understand? There is no opting out of this, brother, sister. The moment you come to Christ, you're enlisted in the captain's band. Who is on the Lord's side? You are, if you are, in Christ. And so, therefore, this is how I proceed in applying Paul's words. Though we live in the world, well, that's very much true. We do live in the world. And we're here to take the gospel into all the world and preach to every creature. Yes, we live in the world, all right. Now, we do not wage war as the world does. Our warfare is not like theirs. And we don't engage in worldly principles in warfare. And the weapons we use are not carnal, not fleshly, not worldly. Now let us come to it. Can you see? How Paul deals with this subject. It's quite obvious. It's heavy on negatives. Heavy on negatives. Now, are you one of a great many who say, oh, negatives? Why be negative? Tell us the good news. Tell us the positive. You know, tell us the nice things. Put it positively to us. Don't go stressing all this negative stuff. Well, my answer to that, my friend, is this. I am a man under orders. And I have one master, and he is Christ. And Christ, when you see his preaching, read the Gospels and you will see. See how negative he can be. Not this. I say to you, not that. Or there's plenty of negatives in Christ preaching. And of course he had his chief agents, the apostles. And I'm reading one of them here now. Now let me show you the negatives. Though we live in the world, we do not, verse 3, we do not. That's a powerful negative, isn't it? We do not. We do not wage war as the world does. Verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not Again, a heavy negative. Indeed, I can go back. There's plenty of negatives early in the chapter. Not this and not that. And he goes on through this passage. We don't wage war like this. We don't use weapons like that. It's the negative. We don't pick up worldly methods, worldly weapons, carnal methods, fleshly weapons. Okay, he doesn't simply mean that we are not fighting with guns and swords. Of course, that's true. We are not fighting with sons and, uh, swords and guns. No, we're not. That's true. But what he means is, we're not fighting with their principles. We're not using their schemes and their plans and their ideas. Their ideas, their schemes, work for their ideas. And their intentions, but our intentions, our aims, our purposes are totally different, says Paul. Now, this is the point I was trying to make uh, when I started. Trying to say that how important, how significant this is. This is what I believe Paul would be saying today if he came back and faced the evangelical world. I think he would say, brothers, won't you learn? We are engaged in a war. We have to fight. We're struggling, yes, but we don't use worldly principles and we don't use worldly weapons. Now, I'm afraid he would have to say, as he's saying to the Corinthians, he's, he's saying this for a purpose, you know. He's not just saying this because he's something to say. I'm not standing here to preach this for something to say. Fill up ten minutes. No, no, I'm not trying to fill up any time. I'm saying this because I believe it, and I believe it's relevant, and I believe it's significant, and I believe Paul was doing exactly the same thing. I'm sure he was. I'm convinced he was. He can look at the Corinthians church, and he can say, you are fighting in a worldly way. You are using worldly weapons, and it's got to stop. Read his two letters, and you'll see it. Let's start there. 
This is always a danger for the church, and it was a danger for the church at Corinth. I believe it's a danger for all the churches in the New Testament. Why is that danger? Well, read the letter to the Corinthians. Let me just pick out one or two points. As you open the first letter and open the first chapter, you soon come across it. Go to the first three or four chapters, and what do you find? A cult of personality. Following men. Oh, I follow Paul. No, 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 I follow Apollos. Oh, no, 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 I follow Christ. And so on. Making superstars of them. Galaxies. Oh, Paul gets more likes, you see. He gets more votes. Oh, no, Apollos, he's the best man. Can you hear it? Well, that's the way the world thinks. We have our superstars of the silver screen, don't we? We have our superstars on Facebook, don't we? We have our superstars on the television, don't we? We have our superstars everywhere on the sports field. And we have them in the evangelical world, don't we? Paul faced it at Corinth. And this is what he's saying to them. Cut it out, he says. Read to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What is Paul? What is Paulus? Not who, but what? But they're just ministers, just servants, says God. The weapons of our warfare are not this superstar galaxy pre-business. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God, but they're not carnal. They're not fleshly. Oh yes, the cult of the superstar. The cult of personalities. That was a real danger at uh, Corinth. How about fleshly meetings? Overeating, indulgence. Read 1 Corinthians 11 and you'll see it. How about disorder in the meetings? Read 1 Corinthians 14. And so go on through the letters. The cult of the super apostle. 2 Corinthians is full of it. You have these super apostles. These men who got this special insight, special gifts and powers. You see, the elevation of man, the cult of man. That was there 2,000 years ago. This is what Paul is putting his finger on. No, he says. That's worldly ways. That's worldly principles. The cult of the Caesar. The cult of the governor. The cult of the businessman. The cult of well, whatever it is. The great athlete in the Olympic Games. No, no, no. Not in the church. Not in the ecclesia. The weapons of our warfare. The principles of our warfare are not like that at all. Then we go to the fathers. But what do they do? Have you ever heard of the fathers linking the state and the church under Constantine? <laughs> well, that's worldly methods. Politics coming into the church. Politics and power politics like that. Money, vested interest. And so it goes on. The weapons of our warfare soon became actually fleshly, worldly, carnal. You know the parable about Christ sending out his servants to compel them to come in. Do you remember that passage? From the fields, the hedges, the highways, the byways, the lanes. Compel them to come in. What do the fathers do about that? Force the heathen to submit by the sword. Make the state enforce religion. And for a thousand years, the political powers forced religion, forced so-called Christianity upon the masses. The weapons of the warfare were certainly carnal in those days. And then came the Reformation. The great and mighty reformers. What about Luther? What about Calvin? Have you ever heard of Calvin? And his view that the magistrate should enforce religion? And he enforced it in Geneva. And he went into the Westminster Confession. And it's still there for many Presbyterians. Many Westminster Confession advocates. The magistrate enforces religion. Carnal weapons, worldly principles, forcing religion, forcing so-called spirituality. Of course, all it does, it doesn't produce Christians, it produces conformists. 
It's like the little boy who his father said he must stand up when singing a hymn. He wanted to sit down. And the little boy resisted, but his father made him. So the little boy said, yeah, he said, I'm standing up outside, but I'm sitting down inside. Praise God. In the days of the Reformers, there were some who saw the wrongness of this enforcement of religion. The Anabaptists and how they suffered for it. But they said it should be voluntary. It shouldn't be compulsory by the state. And they suffered badly for it. You've heard of the Pilgrim Fathers. Well, they left England because they wanted to be separate from the church that was being forced down their throats. But what happened when they got to New England from Holland? What happened? They forced religion in the state in New England. John Smith in uh, Holland in the early 1600s stood for voluntary religion. You can't force it, he said. It must be a willing free. You can't force it by carnal methods. You can't force it by the principles of the world. That's carnal weapons. And of course... Roger Williams in New England was banished because he said it should be voluntary and not compulsory by the state. This is a waging the war according to carnal worldly principles. Make political power enforce religion. You go to the 19th and early 20th century, the churches turn to academe, learning. No, I'm not against learning or books or anything like that. But the idea that learning and education and PhDs, this would be the answer. This would be the way to fight the war. This would be the way to wage our war by learning, by academic material, academic learning. This is the way to do it. There's nothing but a worldly principle. The weapons of our warfare are not what the world thinks are not that way at all. Then you get the 20th and the 21st century, the last 50 years. What's happened now? What happened in the 80s? What happened at Willow Creek and so on? What happened? Believers saw the way the world worked. How did sports teams win their championships? How did business houses sell their goods? How did the entertainment world attract his advocates? How did these things work in the world? Well, they went to these places, they went to the universities, and what did they do? They found out the reports and the statistics, and the, they went to the seminars, and what they, they drew these principles together, and they set up a church system, an evangelism system, a relationship evangelism, a friend, friendly evangelism, seeker-friendly, all this kind of stuff. And what were they doing? They were selling products. They were producing a system that attracted unbelievers to the ecclesia, to the church. But of course, it wasn't the church anymore. They used worldly principles, and they devised a worldly matter, didn't they? A worldly entity. If you go to the sports world, and the entertainment world, and the political world, and the social world, and and, and the business house, and all the rest of it, you will end up with a corporate industrial complex with entertainment and the selling of products. This is what Paul is speaking about. That's why he would be addressing it here today. We may not be using state church, although many evangelicals still advocate Parliament uh, to pass laws to force religion. In my own lifetime, uh, believers have longed for the Parliament in the United Kingdom uh, to pass laws to force Sunday closing on shops, to force people to go to church, shut up everything else and leave them with only one option. To go to church. Uh, I remember talking. My wife and I were out walking in the Yorkshire Dales, and we came across two men mending a wall, and just short of the village of Reeth, and there's a big congregational 
chapel there. And I tried to start a spiritual conversation. So I said to these wallers, I said, remarkable, isn't it? Such a big chapel in such a small village. Just think how many people used to go. I'm talking, I was using this conversation about 30 years ago. And the wallers put down their trowel and he said, yes, he said, yeah, yeah, that's true, he said. But think, they had to go, didn't they? What he meant was, of course, the local businessman, the, chef, the farmer or the mill owner, whatever it was, made sure that his workers could only get a job if they attended the chapel. It was compulsory, you see. Forced religion. Carnal weapons. I'm not talking about hypothetical things, my friend. It's going on all around us. We are in this warfare. We're trying to advance the gospel. We want to see sinners saved. And we've devised systems and courses and um, practical uh, ways of reaching people to attract them. You know this as well as I do. Some of the things are ludicrous. Baking butties in newspapers to get them into church. Cakes on a stall. Anything, entertainment of any kind to get them in in the hope that somehow, somehow they might be converted. No, my friend, it will not do. One of the great things today, of course, is judging everything by Facebook. The number of likes, the number of hits, the number of downloads. And we have our superstars and our galaxies. And we can see the great uh, leading Premier League teams, or the superstars, with all their massive hits and followers and so on. But you see, we're making a dreadful mistake. These things are not the yardstick. We don't wage war. We don't judge our warfare. We don't assess the results by the yardstick of the world. In fact, there's a very, very staggering, powerful text in Luke 16, verse 15. Luke 16 and verse 15. This is a searching word indeed. And it ought to be written right across the evangelical world today. That which is highly esteemed and valued among men is detestable to God. Did you get it? That which is thought to be so wonderful, highly valued, so esteemed among men, even in the churches, even in the evangelical world. Be careful. It's detestable to God. The first shall be last. You see, God's principles, God's arithmetic, God's ways are the upside down of the world. And too often we are judging by the world. Go to the Corinthian letter again. Go to the first letter. And what you find immediately is not the philosophy of the age in which we live. It's not the greatness of men. God chooses the weak, the foolish, the nobodies, the nothings to confound the mighty. It wasn't those who put in all the riches from their wealth. It was the widow with her two mites. The little lad with his five loaves and two fishes. I mean, that's all it is. It's not the great banquets. It's not the great counting houses. It's the nothings and the nobodies. That which is highly esteemed among men is detestable to God. Not by might, not by power, not by Facebook, not by big money, not by the selling. Not by that, says God, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now, I've only dealt with some of the negatives here. Let me just read it. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Let it be so, brother. Let it be so, sister. May we make sure that we're not waging the war that we are engaged in, spreading the gospel, fighting against false teaching, trying to advance the gospel, trying to see sinners converted, trying to see churches built up. May we not use the worldly method 
We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. Make sure of it, my brother and sister. On the contrary, the weapons we use are spiritual weapons, God's weapons. And this is what Paul says about them. They have divine power, not worldly power, not political power, not financial power, not social power. Not emotional, psychological power, whatever word you want. But the power of God's Spirit, not by might, nor by power, in the sense of the world, but by my Spirit, says the Lord, Zechariah 4, 6. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We, de- we, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, not by entertainment, not by pleasure, not by popularity, but by the weapons of our warfare, the preaching of the gospel, praying down the God's spirit, the spiritual power. Only God's spirit can regenerate. Only God's spirit can bring sinners to Christ. Only God's spirit can edify the churches. And that which is highly esteemed among men is utterly detestable to God. I believe this to be a highly relevant word. I believe we've gone over to the world. I'm convinced of it. I've written about it. I've spoken about it. I'm trying to do what I can. This may fall on deaf ears. I don't know. But it may be it will land somewhere and do some good. We are not an industrial complex, my friend. We're not a commercial corporation. We're not an entertainment business. We're not using the weapons of this world and the principles of this world. We're going to go back, are we not, to God's Spirit in our weakness, in our hopelessness and helplessness in ourselves, but in trusting in God and His power. Let God arise and scatter His enemies. Let God take our feeble efforts. Nothing can be more feeble than this. But may God take even this feeble discourse and do good again for us. May he bring us back to his way. May we have done with the worldly methods, worldly ways and worldly weapons and worldly results. And may we look for God to descend in all his power, in all his wonder, in all his grace and mercy. And may it be that even through our feeble efforts, he will yet get glory to his name. Well, that was the text. For though we live in the world, and that's true enough, we do not wage war as the world does. No, we turned our back upon the world. God has delivered us through Christ from this worldly age. Right then, let us show it. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. And may we live to prove it. May yet, may yet we see the glory of God return to his people. Amen.